This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Carl Manchester, 2007. Leviathan, or The Matter, Form and Power of a Commonwealth Ecclesiastical and Civil, Books 1 and 2, by Thomas Hobbes. Printed for Andrew Crook at the Green Dragon in St. Paul's Churchyard, 1651. To my most honoured friend, Mr. Francis Godolphin of Godolphin. Honoured Sir, your most worthy brother, Mr. Sidney Godolphin, when he lived, was pleased to think my studies something, and otherwise to oblige me, as you know, with real testimonies of his good opinion, great in themselves, and the greater for the worthiness of his person. For there is not any virtue that disposeth the man either to the service of God, or to the service of his country, to civil society or private friendship, that did not manifestly appear in his conversation, not as acquired by necessity, or affected upon occasion, but inherent, and shining in a generous constitution of his nature. Therefore, in honour and gratitude to him, and with devotion to yourself, I humbly dedicate unto you this my discourse of commonwealth. I know not how the world will receive it, nor how it may reflect on those that shall seem to favour it. For in a way beset with those that contend on one side for too great liberty, and on the other side for too much authority, tis hard to pass between the points of both unwounded. But yet, methinks, the endeavour to advance the civil power should not be by the civil power condemned, nor private men, by reprehending it, declare they think that power too great. Besides, I speak not of the men, but in the abstract of the seat of power, like to those simple and impartial creatures in the Roman capital, that with their noise defended those within it, not because they were they, but there. Offending none, I think, but those without, or such within, if there be any such, as favour them. That which perhaps may most offend are certain texts of Holy Scripture, alleged by me to other purpose than ordinarily they used to be by others. But I have done it with due submission, and also, in order to my subject, necessarily. For they are the outworks of the enemy, from whence they impugn the civil power. If, notwithstanding this, you find my labour generally decried, you may be pleased to excuse yourself, and say that I am a man that love my own opinions, and think all true I say, that I honoured your brother, and honour you, and have presumed on that to assume the title, without your knowledge, of being as I am, Sir, your most humble and most obedient servant, Thomas Hobbes. Paris, April the 15th, stroke the 25th, 1651. Introduction Nature, the art whereby God hath made and governs the world, is by the art of man, as in many other things, so in this also imitated that it can make an artificial animal. For seeing life is but a motion of limbs, the beginning whereof is in some principal part within, why may we not say that all automata, engines that move themselves by springs and wheels as doth a watch, have an artificial life? For what is the heart but a spring, and the nerves but so many strings, and the joints but so many wheels giving motion to the whole body, such as was intended by the artificer? Art goes yet further, imitating that rational and most excellent work of nature, man. For by art is created that great leviathan, called a commonwealth or state, in Latin civitas, which is but an artificial man, though of greater stature and strength than the natural, for whose protection and defence it was intended, and in which the sovereignty is an artificial soul, as giving life and motion to the whole body. The magistrates and other officers of judicature and execution, artificial joints. Reward and punishment, by which fastened to the seat of sovereignty, every joint and member is moved to perform his duty, are the nerves that do the same in the body natural. The wealth and riches of all the particular members are the strength. Salus populi, the people's safety, is business. Counsellors, by whom all things needful for it to know are suggested unto it, are the memory, equity and laws, an artificial reason and will, concord, health, sedition, sickness, and civil war, death. Lastly, the pacts and covenants by which the parts of this body politic 
were at first made, set together and united, resemble that fiat, or the letters make man, pronounced by God in the creation. To describe the nature of this artificial man, I will consider, first, the matter thereof, and the artificer, both which is man. Secondly, how and by what covenants it is made. What are the rights and just power or authority of a sovereign, and what it is that preserveth and dissolveth it? Thirdly, what is a Christian commonwealth? Lastly, what is the kingdom of darkness? Concerning the first, there is a saying, much usurped of late, that wisdom is acquired not by reading of books, but of men. Consequently, whereunto, those persons that for the most part can give no other proof of being wise, take great delight to show what they think they have read in men, by uncharitable censures of one another behind their backs. But there is another saying, not of late understood, by which they might learn truly to read one another, if they would take the pains, and that is, no say te ipsum, read thyself, which was not meant as it is now used, to countenance either the barbarous state of men in power towards their inferiors, or to encourage men of low degree to a saucy behaviour towards their betters, but to teach us that, for the similitude of the thoughts and passions of one man to the thoughts and passions of another, whosoever looketh into himself and considereth what he doth when he does think, opine, reason, hope, fear, etc., and upon what grounds, he shall thereby read and know what are the thoughts and passions of all other men upon the like occasions. I say the similitude of passions, which are the same in all men, desire, fear, hope, etc., not the similitude of the objects of the passions, which are the things desired, feared, hoped, etc. For these, the constitution individual, and particular education, do so vary, and they are so easy to be kept from our knowledge, that the characteristics of man's heart, blotted and confounded as they are with dissembling, lying, counterfeiting and erroneous doctrines, are legible only to him that searcheth hearts, and though by men's actions we do discover their design sometimes, yet to do it without comparing them with our own, and distinguishing all circumstances by which the case may come to be altered, is to decipher without a key, and be for the most part deceived by too much trust or by too much diffidence, as he that reads is himself a good or evil man. But let one man read another by his actions never so perfectly. It serves him only with his acquaintance, which are but few. He that is to govern a whole nation must read in himself not this or that particular man, but mankind, which though it be hard to do, harder than to learn any language or science, yet, when I shall have set down my own reading, orderly and perspicuously, the pains left another will be only to consider if he also finds not the same in himself, for this kind of doctrine admitteth no other demonstration. End of Introduction Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes The First Part of Man Chapter 1 of Sense Concerning the thoughts of man, I will consider them first singly, and afterwards in train or dependence upon one another. Singly, they are every one a representation or appearance of some quality, or other accident of a body without us, which is commonly called an object. Which object? worketh on the eyes, ears, and other parts of a man's body, and, by diversity of working, produceth diversity of appearances. The original of them all is that which we call sense, for there is no conception in a man's mind which hath not at first, totally or by parts, been begotten upon the organs of sense. The rest are derived from that original. To know the natural cause of sense is not very necessary to the business now in hand, and I have elsewhere written on the same at large. Nevertheless, to fill each part of my present method, I will briefly deliver the same in this place. The cause of sense is the external body or object, which presseth the organ proper to each sense, either immediately, as in the taste and touch, or immediately, as in seeing, hearing and smelling which pressure, by the mediation of nerves and other strings and membranes of the body, continued inwards to the brain and heart, causeth there a resistance or counter-pressure, or endeavour of the heart to deliver itself, 
which endeavour, because outward, seemeth to be some matter without. And this seeming, or fancy, is that which men call sense, and consisteth, as to the eye, in a light or colour figured, to the ear in a sound, to the nostril in an odour, to the tongue and palate in a savour, and to the rest of the body in heat, cold, hardness, softness, and such other qualities as we discern by feeling. All which qualities called sensible are in the object that causeth them but so many several motions of the matter, by which it presseth our organs diversely. Neither in us that are pressed are they anything else but diverse motions, for motion produceth nothing but motion. But their appearance to us is fancy, the same waking that dreaming. And as pressing, rubbing, or striking the eye makes us fancy a light, and pressing the ear produceth a din, so do the bodies also we see or hear produce the same by their strong though unobserved action. For if those colours and sounds were in the bodies or objects that caused them, they could not be severed from them, as by glasses and in echoes by reflection we see they are, where we know the thing we see is in one place, the appearance in another. And though at some certain distance the real and very object seem invested with the fancy it begets in us, yet still the object is one thing, the image or fancy is another. So that sense in all cases is nothing else but original fancy caused, as I have said, by the pressure that is by the motion of external things upon our eyes, ears and other organs thereunto ordained. But the philosophy schools, through all the universities of Christendom, grounded upon certain texts of Aristotle, teach another doctrine, and say for the cause of vision that the thing seen sendeth forth on every side a visible species, in English a visible show, apparition or aspect, or a being seen. The receiving whereof into the eye is seeing, and for the cause of hearing that the thing heard sendeth forth an audible species, that is, an audible aspect or audible being seen, which entering the ear maketh hearing. Nay, for the cause of understanding also, they say that the thing understood sendeth forth an intelligible species, that is, an intelligible being seen, which, coming into the understanding, makes us understand. I say not this as disapproving the use of universities, but because I am to speak hereafter of their office in a commonwealth, I must let you see on all occasions by the way what things would be amended in them, amongst which the frequency of insignificant speech is one. End of chapter 1 Leviathan by Thomas Hobbes Chapter 2 of Imagination That when a thing lies still, unless somewhat else stir it, it may lie still for ever, is a truth that no man doubts of. But that when a thing is in motion, it will eternally be in motion, unless somewhat else stays it, though the reason be the same, namely that nothing can change itself, is not so easily assented to. For men measure not only other men, but all things, by themselves. And because they find themselves subject after motion to pain and lassitude, think everything else grows weary of motion, and seeks repose of its own accord, little considering whether it be not some other motion wherein that desire of rest they find in themselves consisteth. For hence it is that the schools say, heavy bodies fall downwards out of an appetite to rest, and to conserve their nature in that place which is most proper for them, ascribing appetite and knowledge of what is good for their conservation, which is more than man has, to things inanimate, absurdly. When a body is once in motion, it moveth, unless something else hinder it, eternally, and whatever hindereth it, cannot in an instant, but in time, and by degrees, quite extinguish it. And as we see in the water, though the winds cease, the waves give not over rolling for a long time after, so also it happeneth in that motion which is made in the eternal parts of man then, when he sees, dreams, etc. For after the object is removed, or the eye shut, we still retain an image of the thing seen, though more obscure than when we see it. And this is it the Latins call imagination, from the image made in seeing, and apply the same, though improperly, to all the other senses. But the Greeks call it fancy, which signifies appearance, and is as proper to one sense as to another. Imagination, therefore, 
is nothing but decaying sense, and is found in men and many other living creatures, as well sleeping as waking. The decay of sense in men waking is not the decay of the motion made in sense, but an obscuring of it, in such a manner as the light of the sun obscureth the light of the stars, which stars do no less exercise their virtue by which they are visible in the day than in the night. But because amongst many strokes which our eyes, ears, and other organs receive from external bodies, the predominant one is sensible, therefore the light of the sun being predominant, we are not affected with the action of the stars, and any object being removed from our eyes, though the impression it made in us remain, yet other objects more present succeeding and working on us, the imagination of the past is obscured and made weak, as the voice of a man is in the noise of the day. From whence it followeth that the longer the time is after the sight or sense of any object, the weaker is the imagination. For the continual change of man's body destroys in time the parts which in sense were moved, so that distance of time and of place hath one and the same effect in us. For, as at a great distance of place, that which we look at appears dim and without distinction of the smaller parts, and as voices grow weak and inarticulate, so also, after great distance of time, our imagination of the past is weak, and we lose, for example, of cities we have seen, many particular streets, and of actions, many particular circumstances. This decaying sense, when we would express the thing itself, I mean fancy itself, we call imagination, as I said before. But when we would express the decay, and signify that the sense is fading, old, and past, it is called memory. So that imagination and memory are but one thing, which for diverse considerations hath diverse names. Much memory, or memory of many things, is called experience. Again, imagination being only of those things which have been formerly perceived by sense, either all at once, or by parts at several times, the former, which is the imagining the whole object, as it were presented to the sense, is simple imagination, as when one imagineth a man or horse, which he hath seen before. The other is compounded, from when the sight of a man at one time, and of a horse at another, we conceive in our mind a centaur. So, when a man compoundeth the image of his own person with the image of the actions of another man, as when a man imagines himself a Hercules or an Alexander, which happeneth often to them that are much taken with reading of romances, it is a compound imagination, and properly but a fiction of the mind. There be also other imaginations that rise in men, though waking, from the great impression made in sense, as from gazing upon the sun, the impression leaves an image of the sun before our eyes a long time after. And from being long and vehemently attent upon geometrical figures, a man shall, in the dark, though awake, have the image of lines and angles before his eyes, which kind of fancy hath no particular name, as being a thing that does not commonly fall into men's discourse. The imaginations of them that sleep are those we call dreams. And these also as all other imaginations, have been before either totally or in parcels in the sense. And because in sense the brain and nerves, which are the necessary organs of sense, are so benumbed in sleep as not easily to be moved by the action of external objects, there can happen in sleep no imagination, and therefore no dream. But what proceeds from the agitation of the inward parts of a man's body which inward parts for the connection they have with the brain and other organs, when they be distempered, do keep the same motion, whereby the imaginations there formerly made appear as if a man were waking, saving that the organs of sense being now benumbed, so as there is no new object which can master and obscure them with a more vigorous impression, a dream must needs be more clear in this silence of senses than our waking thoughts and hence it cometh to pass that it is a hard matter, and by many thought impossible, to distinguish exactly between sense and dreaming. For my part, when I consider that in dreams I do not often nor constantly think of the same persons, places, objects and actions that I do waking, nor remember so long a train of coherent thought dreaming as at other times, and because waking I often observe the absurdity of dreams, 
but never dream of the absurdities of my waking thoughts, I am well satisfied that, being awake, I know I dream not, though when I dream, I think myself awake. And seeing dreams are caused by the distemper of some of the inward parts of the body, diverse distempers must needs cause different dreams. And hence it is that lying cold breedeth dreams of fear, and raiseth the thought and image of some fearful object, the motion from the brain to the inner parts, and from the inner parts to the brain being reciprocal. And that as anger causeth heat in some parts of the body when we are awake, so when we sleep the overheating of the same parts causeth anger, and raiseth up in the brain the imagination of an enemy. In the same manner, as natural kindness when we are awake causeth desire, and desire makes heat in certain other parts of the body, so also too much heat in those parts, while we sleep, raiseth in the brain an imagination of some kindness shown. In sum, our dreams are the reverse of our waking imaginations, the motion when we are awake beginning at one end, and when we dream at another. The most difficult discerning of a man's dream from his waking thoughts is, then, when by some accident we observe not that we have slept, which is easy to happen to a man full of fearful thoughts and whose conscience is much troubled, and that sleepeth without the circumstance of going to bed, or putting off his clothes as one that noddeth in a chair. For he that taketh pains and industriously lays himself to sleep, in case any uncouth and exorbitant fancy come unto him, cannot easily think it other than a dream. We read of Marcus Brutus, one that had his life given him by Julius Caesar, and was also his favourite, and notwithstanding, murdered him. How at Philippi, the night before he gave battle to Augustus Caesar, he saw a fearful apparition, which is commonly related by historians as a vision, but, considering the circumstances, one may easily judge to have been but a short dream. For sitting in his tent, pensive and troubled with the horror of his rash act, it was not hard for him, slumbering in the cold, to dream of that which most affrighted him. Which fear, as by degrees it made him wake, so also it must needs make the apparition by degrees to vanish, and having no assurance that he slept, he could have no cause to think it a dream, or anything but a vision. And this is no very rare accident, for even they that be perfectly awake, if they be timorous and superstitious, possessed with fearful tales and alone in the dark, are subject to the like fancies, and believe they see spirits and dead men's ghosts walking in churchyards, whereas it is either their fancy only, or else the knavery of such persons as to make use of such superstitious fear to pass disguised in the night to places they would not be known to haunt. From this ignorance of how to distinguish dreams and other strong fancies from vision and sense, did arise the greatest part of the religion of the Gentiles in time past, that worshipped satyrs, fauns, nymphs, and the like. And nowadays, the opinion that rude people have of fairies, ghosts, and goblins, and of the power of witches. For, as for witches, I think not their witchcraft is any real power, but yet that they are justly punished for the false belief they have that they can do such mischief, joined with their purpose to do it if they can, their trade being nearer to a new religion than to a craft or science. And for fairies and walking ghosts, the opinion of them has, I think, been on purpose either taught or not confuted to keep in credit the use of exorcism, of crosses, of holy water, and other such inventions of ghostly men. Nevertheless, there is no doubt but God can make unnatural apparitions, but that he does it so often as men need to fear such things, more than they fear the stay or change of the course of nature, which he also can stay and change, is no point of Christian faith. But evil men, under the pretext that God can do anything, are so bold as to say anything when it serves their turn, though they think it untrue. It is the part of a wise man to believe them no further than right reason makes that which they say appear credible. If this superstitious fear of spirits were taken away, and with it prognostics from dreams, false prophecies, and many other things depending thereon, by which crafty, ambitious persons abuse the simple people, men would be much more fitted than they are for civil obedience. And this ought to be the work of the schools, but they rather nourish such doctrine, for, 
not knowing what imagination or the senses are, what they receive, they teach, some saying that imaginations rise of themselves and have no cause, others that they rise most commonly from the will, and that good thoughts are blown, inspired, into a man by God, and evil thoughts by the devil, or that good thoughts are poured, infused into a man by God, and evil ones by the devil. Some say the senses receive the species of things, and deliver them to the common sense, and the common sense delivers them over to the fancy, and the fancy to the memory, and the memory to the judgment, like handing of things from one to another, with many words making nothing understood. The imagination that is raised in man, or any other creature endued with the faculty of imagining, by words, or other voluntary signs, is that we generally call understanding, and is common to man and beast. For a dog by custom will understand the call or the rating of his master, and so will many other beasts. That understanding which is peculiar to man is the understanding not only his will, but his conceptions and thoughts, by the sequel and contexture of the names of things into affirmations, negations, and other forms of speech. And of this kind of understanding I shall speak hereafter. End of chapter 2